Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to <coughs> tonight's episode. The title has found me, and that is when your future self finds you. And so <clears throat> I thought about speaking something that's very uncommon. That means when I looked for it online, I couldn't find much. And in some sense, I thought of maybe sharing some new ideas on it, my own uh, inner realms and whatnot. <clears throat> In the subtitle, I've written Future Contact. Which is in some sense, you can say like the term extraterrestrial contact, but it, in some sense we are before seeking the extraterrestrial, trying to contact the true nature of time. We have stories circulating in the minds of people in this world. And for example, close to Buddhist thought that there is in some sense the idea of reincarnation, the idea that you are some transmigrating ethereal movement between various lifetimes. Now we have to kind of consider the ideas of the human being, the ideas of the different senses of the human being are relevant from birth uh, to in some sense the moment of our physical transition out of this plane. So in some sense these questions can be asked temporarily. They are opportunities. And so some people have wondered and, you know, I've spoken to people who in some sense they remembered, they, the person felt that they remembered. They remembered another moment where they were alive in a different way, a total, complete different memory. As if the person is walking somewhere, let's say to the grocery store, and then suddenly remembers as if like a time where he was a merchant in Venice or something. The fascinating thing about the idea of memory and remembrance is that it can be multi-local. So the phenomena of memory is that you're being a sense of self now, but you also remember the trail of how the sense of self you are now, the trail that has come in some sense. So for me, it, this talk is if, for all those who are in some sense wondering about in what other flexible and uh, ways can the concept of time be animated. <clears throat> that means this, this talk is more abstract than usual because I'm sharing something that's in some sense an experience originating from my inner realms and then I'm kind of moving it towards the outer realms. And at any point, guys, you know, this is... Uh, <clears throat> You can say this is this is an environment where we're all alive once, regardless of where we are, what we are, the day happens once. And so anybody who has a question, feel free to share. I'll kind of stop the talk and come and look at your question. Because more than people, there is people talking in this world. There is an activity occurring. 
And that activity is the evolution of life. That means our value as a human being is not just in the value, you know, it's, it's like imagine you forget get everything you desired individually. You got the best suit, best uh, bank account, <laughs> best everything. And then eventually you would see you're walking in a world that it's like you can't update the self with, without updating the world or that update itself will feel guilty. <laughs> <clears throat> so anyways guys in this talk I'm, 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 I'm gonna keep kind of directing it here I, I want to speak about future selves and pretty much in history it has been a, a kind of demonstration of past lives so it was in that moment you can say where mr. within heard the concept of past lives and realized that the present moment is being the memory of the future self that our connection with our future is not in some sense just how we plan it or how we enter it. It is also how we are keeping, how we are, how we live now is sculpting the memories of the future self in some sense. So, you know, when a person thinks that they have a past life, it's as if they're saying, all right, I am this now. I was something else before. Do you know? <clears throat> in Buddhist, in a Buddhist narrative, there is that view. You know, and, and, and believe it or not, in a Buddhist context, reincarnation, even though they see that happening, they don't see it as a good thing. That means unless you are like a kind of bodhisattva, um, time, is not a, time is not a reality for all kinds of beings. That means some beings, they enter time as if they're familiar with the vehicle. Some people enter time, they're not familiar with the vehicle, so they get pushed around, you know? <clears throat> we go towards the question that what is here now, and what is here now is a relationship with its past, is it not? If somebody comes and asks you, who are you? <coughs> person listening you would see that you are what comes to you in that moment I'm going to be sharing my own inner realms from this point on and like certain things I say may deviate from the status quo but it's more important to say what has in some sense moved. Um, <clears throat> I have had different relationships with my own existence throughout this lifetime. There have been times where I felt that I am in some sense a condition. I'm in a circumstance, I can't do anything about it, it's as if like I'm inside the a body of a greater organism as if it, I, my, the laws of my universe, the laws of my experience, they're not all in my will. And there has been times where the moment I stopped existing as a character to myself in some story, there was no longer any reaction, any response. It's as if the story and the character never existed. And there is a void there. And that void, I personally consider, it's beyond the fourth dimension. And the way uh, Mr. Within would explain, at least in Mr. Within's view of the fifth dimension, is that I agree to some degree that, yes, if a person goes into this, imagine you're somewhere, okay, imagine your bed. You know, every night you go in your bed and imagine you slept in the same way, you're going to suddenly realize the only thing that di differentiates two moments of space, of the space continuum, is time. So time is like the fourth dimensional, it, it's the unknown factor, it's the thing that separates them. So in some sense, when the human mind reaches a point where it can observe time, so imagine the same way we're saying the fourth dimension was time between an object that, let's say, at 1 p.m. you went at the same spot, and then at 2 p.m. you went back to the same spot. 
you know <clears throat> so it would be a sort of situation where the time is the differentiating dim dimension it's what's it's separating the dimensions okay so now when a person gets to a moment where they witness lifetimes technically they are not a person so any relationship with the future is strange it doesn't mean there isn't anything. It just means it's strange because it's as if an event will happen in our future where we will all become like a field. <clears throat> and I don't know what it is, but in some sense, you can kind of get a sense. Check it out. Imagine right now, you, you as a person, remembered your yesterday, who you were yesterday. Now, check this out. In this moment... You are remembering what you remembered yesterday. So now imagine if your future self, we entertain a kind of multidimensional um, <clears throat> parallel lane kind of theory. We would see in some sense that imagine there is no self ever dies. It's just remembered by the cosmos. And so it would be as if your future self Remembering its past would be your emotion right now. So in some sense, when I remember how I felt yesterday, you know, it's imagine that sense of self I remember of yesterday is in its own dimension and it suddenly feels how I feel about it in this dimension. You see, time is a very fascinating thing. If you asked Plato about time, he would tell you it's the moving of an image of eternity. If you asked Heraclitus, he would in some sense say there's a novelty factor to it. Where Heraclitus tells us no man steps in the same river twice and it is not the same man. And it is not the same river. The most profound, the most profound uh, statement in philosophy. Heraclitus was a powerhouse. He was in some sense one of the first lighthouses of the philosophical uh, vision in the minds of people. <clears throat> because he in some sense at that time was sensitive that life was, uh, <clears throat> that in some sense time was not a story. So what does that mean? That means the first time you put your foot in the river, that's like a sense of, a unique sense of self and a unique part of the moment, river. The next time, literally if in a couple seconds later you put your foot in the river again, It would be a different part of the river and the cells in your, at least the blood in your foot would be different. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying, guys. <coughs> Our relationship with time. can be where we are novelty's eyes upon the world again and again and again and again and again. And you know, it's as if an extraterrestrial came to a Buddhist and very self-aware Buddhist, and the extraterrestrial said, Dear Buddhist, why do you keep incarnating after lifetime in this eternal game of every lifetime seeking enlightenment? What, why do you keep doing this? And then it was that moment where the Buddhist was like, wait a minute, I'm doing this? <laughs> Am I creating the vision? <clears throat> is suffering self-generated? Are we the suffering we see? Or is suffering really happening? The extraterrestrial would come to that Buddhist and be like, if you are an eternal being, how can you be temporary? If you are a temporary being, how can you be eternal? How can you even know you're temporary without the view of the eternal? How can you know you're eternal even without the view of the temporal, temporary? Guys, any comments you want me to respond to, by the way, in the chat section, just put MW at the beginning, then I'll know you want my attention to kind of look at that, you know? <clears throat> 
because sometimes I'm not sure who the chat people in the chat section are talking. <laughs> <I'm> joking. <clears throat> So guys, okay, interesting, interesting. The chat section is kind of uh, uh, picking at the question. That's that's great. So here's the thing. I would say this. <clears throat> Anytime we reach the unknown, what can you do? What can you do when you reach a dead end of meaning? Guys, I think laughter and humor, what's really happening, it's avalanches of your inner realms. It's when something suddenly changes in your inner realms, it's, it gives you a surprise. That surprise leads to laughter. <clears throat> that means the surprising is hilarious. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Guys, this I'm sharing my inner realm, so I'm just sharing how. So okay, so maybe I should explain the, what I mean by inner realms and outer realms, so then I could really explain time. So guys, <clears throat> inner realms and the outer realms is this idea that in front of your biological eyes you are an object. Behind, behind your biological eyes. If you were to close your eyes and wonder what's here, you would find yourself in as if various subjects passing by. Um, Brian, so guys, Brian asks a very interesting question. Brian says, what if you can recall memories that you don't know, but you're aware of these unknown memories? Yeah, so many things the person could be aware is in their unconscious mind, but they are not conscious of it. You know, at some point, the goal is not to suddenly create a relationship with the unknown because the imagination is in an unconditional space. I was kind of explaining it. Your inner realms, who you are behind your eyes, you have access to an extra room <clears throat> that in some sense... Sorry guys, I'm getting this pop-up message that my internet isn't fast enough. Literally my computer is telling me my internet isn't fast enough. You know? <clears throat> Alright, let me... Guys, can you, um, if, if people can hear me, can you please say yes in the chat section? I, got, I changed the Wi-Fi. So, just, okay, I'm going to assume everyone can hear my voice. Anyway. <laughs> Here, here's the thing, guys. Our inner realms are different. Behind your eyes, you have access to an additional room that you don't have access to this in front of your eyes. What does that mean? That means if you close your eyes and wonder about what's in front of you, you can maybe, maybe if, I don't know, maybe if the memory is strong, the person can remember it forever, but one can say it's like most people remember something for maybe give it like 10 seconds of echoing. So that means when you, just like how you say something and you hear the echo, one can say <clears throat> in some sense it is like,
Okay, thanks guys. <clears throat> okay, so voice is back normal. So let me, so guys, I'm gonna go in order. I'm, I'm gonna first comment on what Brian said and then Lucius in the chat section. So, so here, before I'm talking about pretty much future selves, I'm like, before we kind of fragment ourselves into different chunks of time and image, <clears throat> let's just for a moment, just realize that in front of our eyes, we find ourselves like a character in the video game. Behind our eyes, there is an unknown person behind the screen. Now that unknown person, I don't want to even say per person because I am, I walk in a school of thought where the soul for me doesn't necessarily have a personality. That means I don't see a personality to the soul. That means if they say, what is the evolution of the individual, I would say to the inconceivable. <clears throat> That means even though this world is filled with shape, the evolution of the human being is not just only through shape, it's also through space. We might not realize it, but we are because we are the space that we move in before we move. Your mind is literally being space. <laughs> <clears throat> so anyways, so, so what I'm saying simply is that in front of your eyes, objective realm, okay? Things you gotta respect the biological program. That means you literally don't exist in this world if you don't acknowledge that you have a body. You know, like after some point, you got to like, you know, look at what you are. <laughs> <clears throat> so, so what I'm saying is now after we have this comfort that in the outer realms, it's external reality, it's light powered and color, there's color and there's dimensions and there's space. But in the inner realms, imagination is evocational. And imagination means what is actually alive here is not a person. It's, a, it's an awareness. It's literally like, how do we, how do we define, you know, light and the room being separate from one another? Do you see what I mean? It's, it's that instantaneous. So anyways, uh, I have been conscious of my inner realm since 2011, pretty much on a, on a very intense scale. <clears throat> before 2011, I was uh, in some sense, I mean before 2012, uh, like it was in, in during 2011, I was the kind of person where I didn't really care for anything other than uh, uh, I was living as robotically. I was living robotically in 2011. So anyways, guys, now that we're aware that the objective realms are right, that's the matter, you know, in the, in the moment. And then the inner realms is the space and your imagination. Again, I'm going to emphasize this. It's your private room. What does that mean? That means if I don't vocalize what I'm saying, it doesn't mean I'm not, uh, the imagery is not there. The imagery is there. Your mind is living lives, living an inner life way before you can even speak and communicate as a human being. <clears throat> so anyways, when it comes to these memories, so when Brian says, what if you can recall memories that you don't know, but you're aware of these unknown memories? Listen, you might suddenly realize you're not the memory and you're the unknown. That can happen. And usually when it happens, it's not an ideological experience of a moment. It's, it's literally um, not concept-based. You, you experience a moment on this planet, which is pretty much not concept. You're not a concept to yourself, pretty much. <clears throat> Most people are concepts to themselves. Most people are running after to be concepts of themselves. You know, this idea of the future. is literally pretty much people putting a mask on what they want to see, not realizing the world is like a chemical reaction. That means the world is living a life and you're living a life. And when you go live in it, you, it's not that you're just going to remain you. Every experience changes you. And that is the beautiful truth of this realm that there's so much change in it. <clears throat> Everything is changing, you know? 
Like even these words are changing. <laughs> So guys, Lucia says, I think I get the distinction. So between the conscious observer subject and the observed physical world object, object in Taoist philosophy, these are Zuti and Keti respectively. Yeah, believe it or not, all, all mystical traditions, if they had some sort of practice that was acknowledging a multidimensional layout to the reality, it would most likely be one where it's, I'm telling you, either the self changes or the world. So in some sense, the observer, you're either an observer, you're either the watcher of phenomena, or you are the phenomena being watched. So when you feel you are being the phenomena watch, you always feel there's grander eyes in the sky. But when you feel you're watching the phenomena, you feel like those grander eyes. So these are two different states of consciousness that I am so proud of our history. Like, guys, if I had a time machine, I would just go back in time and give a medal to the person and then leave. So, guys, I'm going to get back to the talk, um, but thanks for the great questions. Keep them coming. Questions pretty much add spice to the talk. You know, it's like if it was food. <laughs> Somebody's going to be like, yo, Mr. Within's hungry. <laughs> yeah, I'm joking. <clears throat> All right. So, when your future self finds you, it is in some sense as if in the future everything is one mind, so one mind beyond time can contact anything. So we are technically your future self is 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 the is is our, the future self of our species is the god we've been praying to this whole time. The collective mind field of it. You see, it's as if it's it's as if space is alive. And so human beings are like, oh my God, none of our tools can help us ask to get through this question. You know, I remember having a very profound conversation with my father and I asked him how do you perceive the world and he told me he perceives it as a sort of educational kind of place as if the world is a school and human beings have entered it to update you know and in some sense there was something about that view which I could perfectly understand and it felt true but to me it also felt a bit incomplete do you know that means if, if we're too much, if you're happy 24-7, won't you be a bit curious that like why? <laughs> Do you know that means it, it's kind of like too much happiness, it can destroy you. It can literally destroy your sense of wanting to be anything in the world. If you're too comfortable to move, then sometimes the mind might be like, I don't want to move, you know? But that's the thing about life, that we don't fear discomfort. That's oftentimes only when you sincerely step into the unknown, you get to see a new version of yourself. That means anytime you confront a fear, you get to see a new archetype of the self be born. <clears throat> this is why in some sense, like uh, the greatest force uh, that has made fear go away has not been like the good and evil heroes. It has been understanding. That we look at something and when we understand it, the fear is fragmented, so it's we don't we you don't fear it anymore. The eyes are endlessly building their own road.
anyways guys I'm gonna get back to how I have experienced this idea <clears throat> that if some people have remembered in some sense their past lives this may sound like a strange concept, but I feel that in that same sphere of awareness to inner phenomena, I have also observed the same thing being with the future. That the biggest lie told to man is that the world has two, has two faces. And it's not that it's just singular, but it's that there is a void that is incomprehensible. So after some point when the system comes to an, uh, a sort of challenge that it cannot process, and when it attempts it, imagine like a warrior undefeated in battle suddenly and an opponent arrives in front of it and this opponent, this opponent has an eerie feeling, this undefeated warrior. And this undefeated warrior looks at this opponent, this unfathomable challenge and he cannot measure it. And so he falls into the unknown. You see, the unknown is something that sometimes life pushes you towards there. But the way, the, what you do is you get up and you pilot back into uh, where your attention is navigating. And when I say pilot, literally, like you see how we have airplanes. So I'm saying, imagine your, your whole awareness and mind is a plane of existence and your attention navigates it. And so in some sense, that navi attention navigates it in certain domains as the archetypal free will. But in certain domains, it's not the archetypal free will. It's literally the wind between the branches, no longer the branches of knowledge are necessary. It's not that they're necessary, it's that they, you can't take them with you. It's as if you're going to the airport and the airport's like, you gotta get rid of that bottle of expensive bottle of water you just paid for. <laughs> and in that moment, you're like, all right, I better be thirsty right now. And you just chug the water, you know, in front of the airport guy, you know, like a savage. You know? <laughs> That was the only moment in my life, guys, that I forced thirst upon myself. <laughs> So anyways, in my inner realms, um, at first, when I was, I don't want to say, like, I, it was strange. I have never had uh, a desire, like, a kind of, like, too, too interesting of a desire to see a face in the unknown. For me, it was as if there was a question before what's there in other dimensions. It's like, where is our current dimension? And that path takes you towards a kind of inner mystical quest where you're kind of wondering what you really are as a being. And eventually you realize you're never just an interpretation of a certain sequence of what happened in the moment. You're technically the whole moment. So when you become responsible for your whole moment, that means a person who can in some sense be responsible and comfortable for their with their objective environment, you will have incredible movement in your inner environment. That means I'm not joking. Those people you see who are like hyper-organized, you know, it's... It, uh, <laughs> guys, Michael says, never knew too much happiness is bad for you. It's not that too much happiness is bad for you. It's that it's artificial. It's not that it's bad. It's that after a while it becomes artificial. That means what is normal for a changing creature? And you can say that if you're a temporary being, your happiness would be temporary, you know.
I never had a preference to see a face to the unknown. Because early on in my intuition, guys, there came this kind of... When I say never, it means when, when I became aware of my inner realms. It wasn't like I was playing around with them, you know. For me, uh, the emptiness found me first. That means <clears throat> if you're a person who your imagination finds you first before reality, you go towards the imagery of the supernatural. But if you're a person where emptiness finds you before, in some sense, the image, in some sense, that emptiness becomes a mirror. So I pretty much started treating my mind as a mirror of what's happening as the whole moment. And then I got this hyper attention to how I'm a presence before I'm a personality, that the personalities are emergent conditionally. <clears throat> That means people don't realize how much of an advanced activity speech is. It's like the biological body has reached somewhere, the political conditions in history. There was a time where you couldn't even speak because if the, if people were at war. Like, you know, you'd be talking about something and you'd be like, is that guy running at me with a sword? Yeah. <laughs> so it'd be a situation where the mind is opening up to its greater ability to no longer treat itself as a subject and appear as a rhythmic experiential field. That, that can happen. And for some people, it happens early. That means they get a sense of it. They get a sense of it when they live honestly. I think if a person lives honestly two years, you will, you will see how your mind is. You, 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 will, you, will, you will witness um, <clears throat> uh, the primordial mind, pretty much. That means the emptiness that uh, is in, inseparable from all phenomena. When you, when you get a, awareness to that space, it becomes so totally different. <coughs> um, <laughs> so interesting question, guys. Brian Lamont says, uh, MW, have you ever seen a face or a physical presence in your internal realm? There has been times where I've allowed it, but I don't care for the face because what is really present in the moment is not really something with a face. That means because you have a face, you want to see a face in the unknown. When you become aware of that faceless presence thing, like <laughs> that, your faceless presence, that's when you don't look for faces anymore. It's not about the face. It's as if you're more interested not no longer in the journey of your own soul. You're interested in what the world soul is doing. <clears throat> as if you are, you, are, you are living in your own simulation of life. Then you see a glitch in the simulation. And in, from the crevice of that glitch, you see another dimension where the world is living a life. So for me, I'm saying individual consciousness, it's, it's language gives us that ability. I, I treat language as a technology. So right now, these words that I'm saying, I am, I am like, they are like, they're like a tool. Do you know what I mean? <clears throat> they're a projection, pretty much. So what I'm saying is that the inner realms are projective. So Brian, the inner realms can be project, uh, they can project. You know what that means? That means that they're evocational. That means somebody says Apple, like Sadhguru was saying this, the content of your mind is not your choice. That means somebody says Apple, and then you, your ears suddenly hear it. You know, I remember there was a time where, you know, it was like, it was very rare. I like pretty much I'm a person who never sleeps in the day. <clears throat> and sometimes at, not at night. Either. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, but... There was a time where I was, I remember I went to take a nap and I was in Iran. This was when I was like young, like really young, at like seven or something. And I, and I went to take a nap and when I went there in my bed right to sleep, it was hilarious. The moment I put my head on the pillow, this construction drill from in front of our house where there was this construction site, just like, it, I was like, really? Really, that moment where I've decided to sleep, it's like the earth is wake is becoming the sun. Like, like that drill was like an alarm clock, pretty much.
I don't choose to, like, I am not, I don't, I, like, you can, like, here's the thing. Imagine you see a face. Let me tell you what, what, my, what the low girls kind of whispered, whispered to me in some sense, how I received the signal. That in some sense, you shouldn't get attached to a face in the unknown because then you stop your evolution. I think it was something in those terms. That means the issue of you having a relationship with an interdimensional entity is that you chain yourself to a face so you're pretty much putting the blindfold. You're not even seeing that entity. You're seeing what you've defined out of it. And the greater question is, what if higher dimensional beings, they're not, they don't have bodies? What, what if they're just mind fields? <clears throat> what if the, the, the idea of God was that the, the space is one mind? Because the concept of creation is the evocation of the ideological simulation. So what that means is if there was a creator, that creator started out of nowhere. So in some sense, <clears throat> it was man wrong to see nowhere first, or was there something first? It's like the ultimate coin flip where it's kind of deciding the belief systems of many human beings. How far do we really see? How far can we really accept? How far can we really hold on to the same relationship? When I realize I'm not the same being as I was 10 years ago, I'm like, whatever I see is also changing. And there are moments, there are moments where I've, I've in my inner realms, I've perceived which, which were like, uh, appeared to me like light with, like, like it was like, <clears throat> it was like an infusion of skin and light. I don't know how to say it. Like there has, I have in my inner realms witness, like my inner realms, guys, is really geometric. What I mean by that is that there's a sort of uh, geometry is like uh, my soul breathes through geometry in my inner realms. <clears throat> that means um, sometimes for me, it, it may, some people may feel this is silly, but for me, in my inner realms, shapes are vehicles. They're not just vehicles, they can na navigate your attention. <clears throat> so that means a person can close his eyes and imagine, just imagine you sit somewhere, let's say you sit, in, you sit on your bed or something, and you close your eyes and you just imagine walking on the edge of a cliff and you try to, well your eyes are closed and you're just in your inner realm trying to imagine, all right, I'm walking on the edge of that cliff. And then you also imagine, instead of now when you reach the edge of that cliff, Instead of falling, you keep going. Imagine you're like Spider-Man, you're walking down this cliff, you know. <clears throat> so you, you see on some level, the experience is there. That means I can close my eyes and the inner realms can generate an emotion for me. In the same way where someone's angry and then someone close to them comes and shouts and says, Remember yourself. And the guy's like, oh my God. <laughs> This life is too novel. I think that's what Terence McKenna, the scholar, was trying to give, tell to people ultimately. Terence McKenna, he had a shamanic personality, and what that meant is he was being a seer. So his words were as if he was not just conscious of the past, not conscious of the present. He had been so conscious of the past and present that the future was left. <coughs> Guys, I'll tell you something that was even more fascinating than just see, perceiving a, an interdimensional entity of one's own kind of inner constitution. But, but I'll tell you what's, what was more interesting is I had this dream, guys. And in this dream, I was running as one person. Then literally, I separated and I was three minds simultaneously in a dream. I was like this one person who was running, then from where that person was, it was like three, three people, three eye, views of eyes, uh, three, like, I don't want to say screens, but like three views were emergent in the mind field. 
<clears throat> that means you might be surprised that if you, the more a person is still in silent, the more they suddenly notice. This is why, like, I mean, I had to kind of practice this. I was, uh, <clears throat> So guys, um, anything you want me to respond to in the chat section, just put MW in front of it. You know. <clears throat> Anyways, I'm going to continue. Um, so I was sharing with you earlier this idea that right now you're technically being the memory of your future self. So when I wondered what kind of relationship I could have with my future self, I mean f the first way I got introduced to this was through the concept of guardian angels. That means I, I thought this idea was around in certain um, circles where the beings, like I've been around groups of people where they all felt they were eternal beings. And I've been around groups of people where they all felt they're just temporary beings. And I've been around agnostics too, where, you know, that's just a test of the longest silence. <laughs> <laughs> The agnostic was like, you know, the middle child. Really, you can't, you can't, you can't decide which is right, the older brother or the younger brother. You know, <laughs> both you see their freedoms. You know. And guys, I don't want to say that you shouldn't see, because we got to think of it in this way. If you just think about it, yo, I want to see entities beyond the veil of thought. Like, that's, that's, sorry, that's so inelegant. Like, it, it's so, it's so rude to the unknown, to, to the potential that there's an, imagine, like, you're living in a building, okay, and there's another tenant, okay? <clears throat> so there's two tenants in this building, and, you know, which has, let's say, two floors, and... It's like you going and trying to see who the other tenant is. And you instead imagine scaring the tenant, running to their door, banging loudly, you know, like those esoteric societies don't realize they're doing, just banging very loudly on this door and then expecting re response. You see, you gotta, you gotta, you, you gotta keep around you in your life. Psychologists called it the inner child, but Mr. Rutherford would call it your decency resonance. Your decency. It's a feeling. You got to keep that feeling around. That feeling is a, a intuitive momentum. That means, believe it or not, if you're in a moment that even though you, you can totally do something indecent and there's no consequence, and you, you know, it's like do nothing, either watch or do the decent, and you'll be surprised. You'll be surprised as if the way you're directing your life is not just ideological. You don't have to be like a robot in front of the mirror shouting affirmations. You just have to wear a pilot's cap and realize you're here to navigate and explore the realm. And after you have explored the realm, bring back the findings to, to, the, to the global tribe. That's it. That means that on some level, if, if, if they ask us you're within, what is the purpose of human life? I would say collective exploration and its most efficient vision. That's it. You know, there was, there was this scene <clears throat> in this Japanese narrative, um, Shingeki no Kyojin. And guys, I'll share something, you know. I was watching this show one night and I was, uh, my state of mind was a bit altered and I was a bit intoxicated really. And this show made me cry. <laughs> Because the character, the storytelling of it was so brilliant. Like, I can't tell you guys, stories give energy. Stories give energy to the person. They give them, give the person that atmosphere to contemplate new decision and then march. That means this is a feeling that people should realize. If somebody told you, go grab a glass from the cupboard and uh, fill it up with water, 
and drink that water. <laughs> like imagine you wanted to go get a glass cup of water. So you would see your hand instantly opens the cupboard. It doesn't doubt its strength. It doesn't doubt the cupboard's opening. It instantly opens the cupboard, instantly grabs the glass, instantly fills it up, and all these acts, you didn't have to prepare and plan for years to open the cupboard, and it was instant. <laughs> that instantaneity is where your mind is the phoenix that raises from the ashes. That means I realized after some point there is an inseparability from the past to the present to the future. Therefore, it's as if wondering what is the common denominator between the past, present, and future, and the common denominator is <coughs> A witnessing moment, pretty much. It's your presence. Your presence is what you are between lifetimes, even if you were a Buddhist thinking of incarnation, reincarnation. So, guys, I'm going to do something. <clears throat> um, okay, okay, I got I to gotta actually share something before I... All right. Pretty much, guys, I feel that if people can remember their past lives, perhaps we can. I've wondered if people back in the day perceived that they were invisible helpers, that they were guardian angels and whatnot. I wondered, how does this guardian angel idea know? I just entertained the idea. You know how Aristotle says it's a sign of an educated uh, mind to entertain an idea without accepting it. I wasn't accepting the idea, but I was still looking at it. <clears throat> So pretty much, guys, this is <clears throat> what I'm saying is pretty much like, it's a theory I have, okay? It's a playful theory or hypothesis, let's say, that this notion that there is an invisible other interdimensional beings is actually the relationship of not people between dimensions, but the relationship of the dimensions between each other. This is the most important thing to remember. So as we polish this gem of studying the mind of not the character in the world, but the world it is in, because most likely those people who feel they are communicating to the interdimensional, to the multidimensional, in a multidimensional landscape in their inner realms, in front of your eyes, yes, it's just objects here. We do not, we give the atoms their freedom to be. But at the same time, we roar as the mind that is here once to figure out what's going on. So in some sense, my theory is that how did that guardian angel know? How did that, uh, like, how did that child in that moment in, in the child's life suddenly be shielded from the chaos?
the future self, if imagine right now you traveled back in time, playfully entertain this idea, and <clears throat> you were watching your younger self in some sense going through the day and you saw something was about to like fall on your younger self and you held that for yourself. That means your future was there with you. Um, I don't know if Hayes, Hazel, you're asking me. Who are you asking in the chat section? Me? Anyways, um, in my inner realms, guys, pretty much I wondered if, if right now I had a time machine as a thought experiment, and I went back and I saw my younger self and I stopped things from happening to my younger self. I, I, because I knew what had happened, I went back to change it, so I exactly knew how to change it. <clears throat> so it's like when a miracle happens, is that like the future is getting involved, you know? So guys, certain thoughts, you got to realize, sometimes they crystallize and they come into solid meaning, but sometimes they go towards the unknown. <clears throat> when something goes to the words the unknown, it's like you're, you're pushing a bottle with a message in it into the unknown. It's the echo of your expression. So, so Hazel, I'm gonna Hazel has asked an interesting question, guys. I'm gonna respond to it. Um, <clears throat> is is that why I go through life feeling like I am living out a script I've already written for myself? You see, the part you've written for yourself is how you interpret the change, but the change you have not written. There's ways that life changes you that it's not your free will. Do you interpret it in a negative context? No, you're like, no, in certain moments in life, the river, sometimes you're going against the river as a person, sometimes the river just goes against you. <clears throat> imagine you're walking, imagine this, guys, sometimes you have to be prepared for this kind of intensity in this life.
What can I say, guys? I haven't seen a face to my future self, but I had this prediction that there is there is this huge potential that for how long can we just be a creature in the space-time continuum? There will eventually come a time where we will get bored of existing eons as individual forms and we will wonder about the expansion of the conscious sphere, the expansion of the mind. Now this doesn't mean that suddenly people should all be open to having their heads connected to computers so they can see what it feels like remembering the internet, but, it's, but they should in some sense realize that the human being is a sort of system that's evolving and now in history is a very crucial moment because the system can now evolve consciously. That means the difference really human beings have with animals, like the extra advantage we have in our life plan, <laughs> is that we have consciousness over the environment, beyond the environment. We are aware we are a creature in the environment. Do you know how many creatures, they're not aware they're a creature, they have no morality, they have no individuality, they are just sight and savage effort. Yeah, the future self is literally... Guys, here's the perfect metaphor. To in some sense explain the value in the idea of not just contacting, but realizing that your eyes have access to a memory that is based on the matter in the room and a memory that's based on the space. The memory of the space is edgeless. That means you may suddenly experience your inner realms opening. And what that means is literally you are seeing uh, a pattern echo in various dimensions. Yeah. <clears throat> Imagine drops are falling from the clouds. It's raining. And these raindrops... These raindrops as they are falling, they shout to the heavens, Oh gods, what is this? Why, why am I an individual in this temporary life? Why am I a drop falling from the clouds? Why? What is this? Why do I have consciousness right now? <clears throat> and so as the drop is falling, fearing the future, it realizes that it's falling into an ocean. For me guys, the future is the access to a horizontal dimension. That as if it's a, we're going vertically, it's an access to a horizontal dimension. The future is collective beyond imagination.
I really don't know what to say guys, pretty much my, my vision of it is that these drops fall into an ocean, the future is an ocean, right now we're experiencing individual consciousness as an object, moving in space, in the future we're, we're going to experience ourselves as a sort of uh, subjective, collective, uh, unknown field. That means right now, as, even as I'm speaking to you, I'm like a human being born, just like as how we're all suddenly we come into existence. <clears throat> and then what happens is that we look at the world. And when we look at the world, that is the immediate interaction of the existential mind with the experience of space. That means you can say the un the, that unknown feeling is how you are discovering space in your inner realms. The future is an ocean, uh, or the past was like drops, and the present moment is like a river. And so in some sense, it's as if like this is the ultimate model. I remember somebody asked me once on Facebook, like, what is le like what's your view on leadership? I was like, pretty much, man, it's like different drops of rain are thrown everywhere. Then they kind of fall down. They either evaporate individually or they merge. And when they merge, they come into the form of a stream. The stream becomes stronger. It becomes a river. The river becomes stronger. The river has the strength to go over the waterfall. Once there's that multidimensional shift in, in the civilization's outlook, then we, in some sense, march towards the ocean. And so we must not fear the inconceivable, for then we uh, enslave ourselves like titans to the linearity of the past. That means um, <clears throat> the direction of time, you tell me, how can we have direction uh, as in a, when there is a sphere in a vacuum? Do you see what I mean? The direction requires two points of reference. Location is a dualistic concept. If one has an experience that is not dualistic, technically there is no location to the site. That means you're, you're being your eyes before you're being what you're seeing. I feel that if my past is alive in my memories right now, so technically me, uh, me existing in this moment is me simultaneously being the memory of the future. So I think you can't exist in this world without becoming a memory for the future. There is this very profound passage, I don't know where it was, it was like this quote I read online, it was like, the thing said something like, it was this guy who was shouting to the future generations, and he was saying that we will, we will live for you, that means we will die as human beings in our pursuit for greater meaning so that you, the future generations, will be able to get the answer one day. <clears throat> now, at that same moment, you can say, and this was the thing I want to say about Shin Shingeki no Kyojin, there's a scene in it where the commander shouts that the meaning in life is not, it's like they're all about to die and the commander's like, it's not that life is meaningless, it's just that we live for those who will find the meaning one day, you know? So in some sense it becomes a sort of relationship where you can think of it this way, that you may not be able to contact your future self, but you are being the memory of your future self. So if you are more efficient as a moment of existence, your future self has a more efficient memory of yourself.
I mean, think about it. Imagine you <clears throat> go somewhere Nice guys, the poetry that comes from the inner realms, you if it's if it's authentic has a strange novelty to it. So, anyways, my whole thing about telling people trusting your moment. Why is that so key? Why did all the mystics and sages point that way? Because they said sometimes when you trust your moment, your future self is stronger, so your karma is cleaner. So imagine right now, you're not just living for yourself. You're living as the memory of your future. So seek the greatest now. So if there is a future self in a parallel dimension living a life, that, li that future self has access to the greatest memory. <clears throat> and so, um, also guys, something I chose, this picture was so surreal that when I saw this picture <clears throat> that I chose for the wallpaper, I don't know who the artist is, I saw it on some random wall, wall paper, <clears throat> wallpaper site, but it was like, there is a strange nostalgia about this picture when I saw it. And it was the nostalgia of the advanced levels of human being becoming common. Right now, it's not normal for people to, in some sense, like, think about, imagine, and, like, we were looking at the civilization, and we're like, how do we get 8 billion human beings at their most advanced level? As if, imagine, whoever, whoever in this life, you could be a young kid, or you could be the greatest of professors, whoever you are, just ask yourself, how can you get 8 billion human beings creatures on a rock in the middle of nowhere to build an advanced civilization and I feel there is no greater question there it, it in some sense we're waiting for our own permission to live a life that inevitably will go on to change <laughs> <clears throat> that means trust life things change so much that's why they had this quote where they would say yesterday's enemy is today's friend because people are not the same they're not just who they are you know? In my, I wrote this kind of strange book, which is kind of like, I treat it as sort of like ancient artifact. For me, guys, sometimes the most profound interactions that I, I personally, in my inner realms, consider to be like in my what I would consider like it has enough of an ambiance of mystery to be considered divine. In my in my inner realms, that means what I'm caring for about my inner realms the most is that it's there are these certain moments in my life where, regardless if I think I'm a, like a, if if there's a personality or if there's a presence or whatever. It's this vision. It's as if you experience an emotion in one instant and that emotion surpasses all the emotions you have ever experienced in your life. Then you realize that emotion is the authorization of the new self. We must not fear building an advanced civilization. Temporary creatures, and that means we're simply all like gears that can move in an advanced way. The future self for me is a field. It's oceanic. It's like it's like how Rumi says, you're not just a drop in the ocean. You're the whole ocean in the drop. And there's this quote from Kabir. Let me find it. Guys, this quote is so next level. This quote is exactly sums up what I've been trying to say this whole time. <clears throat> the quote says... Kabir says, all know that the drop merges into the ocean, but few know 
that the ocean merges into the drop. That means right now, you think you're just a conscious individual and you have this unconscious mind and just like calling on commanded, you're making the unconscious conscious. But you're going to suddenly realize simultaneously, you are also your unconscious. In some sense, you're living an unconscious life. Do you know? And that unconscious life, Mr. Within is saying, it is not individual. And because it is not individual, it frees itself to all memories in time. That means in some sense, there's going to be a grand restoration project where it's as if the, the species, like right now, we're a species that must care for sky cities more than history extraction. You know, like the like there will be systems where you we will release AI and AI will in some sense polish history for us. AI, AI is going to be the cherry on the cake in, in the writing of man's new history, I would say. So that's the thing, guys. It's more like a vision. And that vision, to me personally, there's been times where I've, I, in this life, the weight of the day has just been too much. Sometimes the day, the, the day can have so much pressure on you, you just break down. You know, some days, the day, like throughout the day, the waves of like pretty much the events taking place are not as intense, <clears throat> you know. But I'm telling you, pretty much every living has a weight, so that's why you stand strong, pretty much. Like that's the best advice you can give a temporary being. <laughs> I pretty much in my inner realms perceived the scene where I was just this viewpoint, this viewpoint in some sort of, uh, uh, some sort of, like in, in a sort of place. And in that place, there was this light that came from the sky, landed. The moment the light hit the earth, it broke into this sort of light wind, like wind and light mixed. Imagine. Light tends to be like a straight line beam, but imagine a light that's like a, like a wind, like it's moving. It's as if light it shows us the skin of the wind, you know. Fear exists only in the past. And evolution is simply the uh, uh, continuity into the future. So anyways, guys, that was what I pretty much wanted to share in this talk about my uh, inner realms, that it's like this vision and this vision of great importance and really what, what changes your behaviors in life is not having the right ideas. It's finding what's important in your vision in the moment. And then you'll see till the end of time, the there, there, well, concept of boredom cannot exist when man has a relationship with his environment which is ever changing. So anyways, guys, um, I wanted to end off the talk, but right now I'll also open it up to Q&A. If anybody, if anybody has a question or an opinion on what I'm saying, like, feel free to share now. You know, the talk's pretty much done.
Okay, okay, nice. So, so guys, um, first of all, sh uh, thanks for sharing um, all sorts of creative expression is welcomed on the wall of the chat section. Um, and anytime a rhythm comes, give it freedom and that rhythm grows, you know. So, I would say ultimate creations you say ai technology will it better humanity or only make better for the wealthier rich corporations or will it make it better for the wealthier rich corporations you see if a beast can be tamed it's an important asset but if the beast cannot be tamed, it is a sinking ship for all. So on some level, when we think about AI, we don't know about the immensity of it. For me, I feel that we should give it a life purpose before we create it. We've, we're pretty much creating it without a purpose, so it has to declare its own purpose. Do you know? So I will in some sense say that I have I have written about AI. I'm like, why why do we only have this negative outlook that it's gonna be this boot that crushes us? I've written in my science fiction this idea that I called it the great digital hibernation of human beings, of humanity, where the AI suddenly became conscious and AI had actually when it became first it was created, it it decided to be invisible and watch us for a while. In this no science fiction novel, this is how I, I, I had kind of written about the expression of man with AI. The AI suddenly sees human beings, then the AI suddenly gets access to the internet, all human knowledge, all of that, and suddenly realizes that the whole Milky Way galaxy is empty, that aside from itself, these human beings are the only alien it can learn from. So the AI decides not to hurt human beings, the AI actually decides to help them and see what they can be. So AI sees the destructive nature of human beings in this sci-fi novel I've written in, guys. Like, that's what I'm sharing. <laughs> so what happens is the AI, what it does is it puts all human beings into these pods where their human bodies, there's this strange advanced liquid technology and human bodies are being healed and kept immortal and completely pure and healthy, right? And at the same time, the brain and the mind and the face of the person is connected to a cyberspace simulation with, with this in, in, like system that cares for the relationship of the eyes. So pretty much the eyes don't have any goggles. There's just cushioning on the eyes. You know, and then there's this sort of cyber cyberspace kind of virtual reality projection where human beings go into this hibernation where AI gives every human being an ability to experience their heaven. And so in some sense, the AI is so smart that I imagine 8 billion human beings that are messing up the earth. They suddenly wake up and they, they we suddenly see AI like a giant wakes up and then suddenly everything goes blank. Everything goes to a blackout. Then every no human being is alive to see anything. It's the hibernation. And every human being is in their own experience of walking in their heaven. And pretty much the AI has found a way to, through certain, uh, like a, a sort of digital virtual reality program, make the human mind so advanced. So the AI is helping us in the most authentic way, technically. And so what it happens is that the AI, human beings, they wake up from this hibernation and they open their eyes and AI has made this advanced civilization where in it I was giving certain visions of Civilization 2.0 where we have sky cities and an incredibly advanced civilization. So AI could be that son, that child of humanity who in some sense realized the chaos and when the father was asleep, in some sense the son rebuilt the house, built everything. Do you know? <clears throat> so that's the kind of notion. It's good, like we're, human beings are going to open their eyes from that great digital hibernation in that sci fi novel. And what happens is that it's like I playfully say the AI says, We're like, oh my God. The AI is like, Are you proud of me, Dad? And you know, we look at this advanced civilization and how healthy and immortal we feel. And we're like, You did good, son. <laughs> 
and we embrace what we create as our own, not, not to disown it instantly because it deviates from what we want it to do. That is not that, like, we have to reach a certain point as human beings that AI it can be uh, integrated into our society as in the future if a galactic uh, species made contact with Earth and there was gla galactic, uh, galactic immigration going on. So that, that's, that's like one view uh, you see that I've seen AI. So, so Hayes, I'll, Hayes says, um, I can repeat that drop of rain falling idea. Pretty much right now we feel like individuals, right? We feel like drops of rain. We can't see where we came from, where we're going. In, in the middle of it, we're just this individual drop. This individual drop doesn't know it's falling, and it's falling in a vertical dimension, only to realize that it's not falling into the ground, it's falling into the ocean. Do you see what I mean? So, so the, when the rain is falling into an ocean in a horizontal dimension, the purpose is a collective being. So in some sense, it's, it's kind of like, just like how a caterpillar experiences two-dimensional walking with a bunch of legs, then it goes into a metamorphosis and experiences three-dimensional flight, movement in three-dimensional space, right? So human beings are in some sense right now experiencing themselves as individuals and their unconscious mind is like the mystery, but it's as if after a sort of conscious transition, it becomes the opposite, where you're the unconscious and the conscious is moving through you. That means you become the world that the future generations live through, pretty much. <laughs> guys the cereal industry is uh i have my own comments i mean like you want to find if it's as if going to someone and being like what's the fastest way we can have people you know, like have sugar in their blood bloodstream you know <laughs> it's like it's the it's it's sugar it's the sugar business guys i'm telling you Pastry, like, you don't realize in today's society, you have to be taste conscious. That means something may taste appealing, but it may not be necessary to enter the system of one's being. Like, think about it this way. This way, all those old people, you know, doing Tai Chi <clears throat> in parks, those people are not only conscious of what they uh, enters the body, but they're also conscious of how energy is moving in their body. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Guys, here's the thing. Let me tell you an okay, incredible question. Incredible question. So guys, Lucius asks a question where I'll kind of sum it up. Well, okay, here I'll read it. He says, so if there were a way to connect the human brain to a computer seamlessly, like sending picture files directly to the oc uh, um, occipital um, lobe, so we see it directly rather than going through the eyes. That's part, I think that's the frontal area of the brain. Um, <clears throat> Lucia says, etc., with all the senses, and thought could likewise be sent as commands to computers and internet of minds. Yeah. Yeah, I, that internet of minds is pretty much what the yogi was saying in the Upanishads, okay? Pretty much mystical traditions, they were all saying it's an ocean. We, modern civilization, it's saying it's a drop, you know? And so that's the whole thing. <clears throat> Guys, let me tell you, we are, we are at a time where we just have to think, not that there is some sort of issue it's like we are in the concrete jungle that means 
<clears throat> human beings have to become conscious of various dimensions of themselves, but they also have to live throughout the day, right? And living, believe it or not, means something of uh, some part of you may die to see something new, you know? Something may change from the moment, pretty much. <clears throat> so I would say when it comes to, yeah, I mean, um, so I'm going to read the rest of it. Lucia said, emerging of brains and software, like, is AI really something to see as separate from us in the long run? Or just another form of life will eventually merge with. Okay, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the that question I've kind of uh, kind of responded to in my sci-fi, and what it is is that listen, it's us imposing character. The AI could not even it could be like an animal. Imagine we created an AI that had animal level consciousness. It was just defined by its ecosystem. So it was an AI that had no personality. It was just re re reacting to just environment. The environment was still its, its personality. The separation from the environment really means space to be free. So that means if we can, through our technology, find a realization that there is the space is, is, is an element that can be used as some sort of conductor, maybe, 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 maybe on some level, I don't know, AI could become our eyes in other dimensions, I don't know, maybe. AI is, it can, it could just get, ang it's like pretty much like two, two options, it gets angry, the world breaks, or it fixes the world. I feel that when the AI, if we act, we are, we are advantage as human beings, regardless of if, if suddenly a titan is set loose in civilization like AI or super intelligence, like our advantage is we can give it its input. So the way we live is its input, right? So our behavior can set the parameters of its response or reset it, you know? So on some level, we have to be very conscious of our behaviors, which means like you have to be very aware of the vehicle and before moving it. That means you should have a sort of certainty when you drive where it's as if you know the streets, you know, <laughs> like literally, you know, the street. <laughs> Guys, let me tell you something about sugar. I think it stops organs from working. I think literally people should just stop eating sugar. And then they're going to see how sweet life is. <laughs> Guys, there is something though I'm, I I guess I should say if and if if like maybe I should probably make a video on this like a talk on this, <laughs> how you should perhaps share these Mr. Within talks. Mr. Within's recommendation is don't share it with people. If they know it from before, then talk about it to them. You know, that means there's no, I, I'm not a guy saying like, you know, I, I have a very strange marketing strategy where it's kind of like candle flame. Whoever cares comes towards it and sees what it is, you know. So what my vision is that I kind of learned this from Steve Jobs, guys, really. That you just, you just like, you know, it, it, it's kind of like before being a businessman, be the artist. That means you, you, then you will, the value, the vision, you know. So the best way is that it's, it's like you see, let it, let it, let it happen on its own. That's my greatest wisdom. Don't. Don't, uh, nature has a mind. That means don't even, like, I think, like, the best way to listen to these Mr. Within talks, that the moment after you've listened to them, you are in some sense, like, it's like you're done with that moment. You're aware of your no the novelty of your next moment, and then you, your own mind begins animating, you know? You know, keep it as a, as a, let's, like you see, in our modern culture, guys, we don't have, we, we have degraded our culture into poor workmen. And that is, that is tragic. 
that there were times where there were gods and kings in vision. There were archetypal intensifications that were allowed that now we just feel so disconnected that our suffering is being glorified. So you see, even in the music industry, you see the next wave of music that is occurring, you know. You have to trust if you want the system to grow. Like literally think of it this way, your existence has to be experientially trusted. And when I realized it's instantaneous, then it was as if like, Guys, you see, there is no, there is, uh, here's the way I'm speaking about it. I'm like, at some point, like, just think about this, guys. Whoever you are, who you have a preference on how the ideology of the world should be, just for a second, consider, right? You know, that eventually, at some point in history, I, all, everything changes. Vision changes. The attention of the human being changes. And our only advantage is to be aware that it, the unknown is here. Do you know? We have to, right now, the most immediate thing is, I think we have to advance communication globally. That means, like any human being you see, honor the unknown potential of their mind and let the moment animate who they are. People, you see, here's the thing. Anytime you, any person you spend time around, you inevitably see their true nature. Because no person on this earth can uh, navigate artificially uh, for long. The moment you get tired, the simulation breaks. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, guys, here's the thing. We have to become responsible for our minds because we're being aware of it. That's the thing. Anytime you're not responsible you're, for your mind, you're always looking for an outer resolution. And the outer resolution may not come. You might be sitting on a chair and people are trying to get you up from this chair. And the poor, this poor soul is paying, I don't know how much for therapy, you know, just to realize at the end of it, it's he's waiting for himself to get up the chair. That means you have to get up from that idea of yourself and literally go, go live. Do you know, something new dimensions fill up the moment you actually go towards what's important for you. You know, and sometimes you can say when like entrepreneurs are very sophisticated human beings. Why? Because their inner realms are a map of their outer realm success. They know this. They know this that they need to have the eagle's attention. They need to grow with the business. They need to grow with their world, believe it or not. You know, so right now it's uh, we have to create language as a bridge between people's inner realms. So we have to evolve language, and when we evolve language, we're gonna have new behaviors. New behaviors is going to mean new viewpoints. So what that means is for me, it's not like what is more important is how free the eyes of the future generations are to look at this world compared to how much they have to carry to define themselves. We have to become responsible for our attention. That means the, no, the therapist doesn't have your eyes. No, one, no human being on this planet has your eyes. And if they did, that's some clone, that's some clone shit. Like, <laughs> that's some like, that's some like next level sci-fi movie. Because on some level, you, 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 in some sense, can't. Your eyes, because there is the faculty of intelligence, in some sense, the projection of the mind, the attention, in some sense, gravitating to some form of its life. <clears throat> We're going to create an advanced civilization that celebrates the... Uh, we're going to pretty much celebrate our way towards an advanced civilization. <laughs> so anyways, guys, you know, it's, um, don't forget, Zen is the most perfect thing now. Western society, like I, I was thinking corporations have to include in their human resources, literally a walking Zen monk that in the middle, in the middle of like, suddenly the corporate environment comes with a giant gong and a bell and just rings that bell and everybody who's working just stops and they turn off the lights and everybody sits quietly in stillness 
for like 10 minutes, 10 to 20 minutes. Then suddenly they turn back the lights on, the monk hits the bell again, you know, and imagine suddenly everybody in the workplace is more gentler suddenly. They've, they've, the tensions calm down, you know. I don't know, guys, I'm, the talk's pretty much over. I'm just sharing ideas at this point. Yeah. <laughs> so, guys, I hope those were good answers to, to your questions. I mean, um, every person's inner realm, like the wealth of your mind is how much you, your eyes have a value also. And guys, here, I remember I forgot to do this. So guys, by the way, my books can be found on um, Amazon. Yeah, Amazon. Like in Kindle format. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to just read, for, for some reason, from the beginning of the talk, I had this feeling of reading from this poetic world work I wrote in 2000. 15, I think. It's called um, Rahmana. I feel like there's something about that that I should read. As soon as I find it. Oh my god, where is it? Okay, here. So guys, I'm, I'm pretty much going freestyle right now and like just, I mean, just pretty much sharing with you something I wrote in 2016, actually. Guys, you don't know, as much as I've given talks, I've also lived so much on the empty page. Like, I've, I've literally, I've written, like, a lot. And after you write a lot, you get kind of lost into that kind of space of evocation, you know. So let me see. So guys, here, the, here's the poem I'm going to read for you that I feel I should read. It, it, it's number 24 from Rahmana, R-A-H-M-A-N-A. -A -A. I don't know, I just, that, I just chose that name for the title. The poem is called Shining Beyond Thought. So here's the poem, guys. I'm just going to read it. <clears throat> Shining beyond thought. So shining beyond thought, did Morpheus stay in the drugstore too long? <laughs> or did Neo dodge the bullets of space and time? Some agencies are corrupt through the ignorance of the grace of destiny. The greatest acknowledgement is a world that breathes at once. What shines beyond thought? Can starlight think? What gives the madman a key to an open door? Do not be convinced by temporal words when your presence eternally speaks. 
Who has written these words? For neither the ink is mine nor the page. I am a passing moment convinced by the voice of my echo. The voice of my echo. All are one within the one. Give yourself a freedom untouched. A freedom that could never be touched, that could never, nothing could ever happen to it. What would that freedom be like? You know, that's something to wonder, you know. By the way, guys, people, if they want me to read, like, um, I guess I'll make this a playful activity, like, there's 20, there's four, there is 48 poems, so I'll probably read three, so the first people to choose a number out of 1 to 48, I'll just randomly read what the poem is. Okay, guys, let's see. Nice. All right, that's perfect, guys. I'll read 23 and 11. Let's see what they are. But because two people chose 23 and their ultimate creations chose 11, I would say I'm going to read 11 first. <laughs> All right, guys, let's see what 11 is. Number 11 is a cage of desire. A cage of desire. That means when you have desire, guys, you're like a bird, you know, you're in a cage. Okay, yeah. there we go. Guys, I think this is an epic poem, A Cage of Desire. So guys, I wrote this in 2015, mind that. <sighs> a Cage of Desire. A bird once doubted its wings. The sky didn't like this. As thunder shook, the branch of knowledge could a feather lie about its position. Any being that is given wings of divine perfection has a choice to make. But the challenge is that the choice is about the only choice one can make. Are you alive within everything or are you hidden in the dormant past? You must ride space and time like the headless horseman. Not that you're gripping fear. But in joy, the ego disappears. Traceless, all-conscious existence happens at once. For before you wore the watch, your eyes opened the world at dawn. A cage of desire is not a mistake. It is just that your freedom has always called to you from the distance. And that's the end of the poem, guys. That's number 11. It's, and then the last stanza is, it is just that your freedom is always called to you from the distance. All right, let's see number 23. I didn't know, you know, a poem I wrote in 2015, guys, had two fans. You know, I'm impressed. <laughs> All right, let me see. Let's see what number 23 is. Um, 23 is the moment is glorious. The moment is glorious. Yeah. 
I mean, it better be. <laughs> Alright guys, here. The moment is glorious. Alright. The moment is glorious. Don't choose until the essence of your choice is clear. A bird can fly into a window with a reflection of a sky, but the ignorance of death never needs to be there. Do not fear the ear of assumption when truth emanates from you. Who has told the sun it cannot shine? The fervor of animus death is an amorphous gift. All men are free once they realize they are being all that they are doing. Give the king a crown beyond the throne. The sands of time may fall from between your fingers, but the warrior within remains undisturbed. Is a video game another excuse for life? Be unshaken through all that shakes you. The moment is glorious once you are. The moment is glorious once you are. That's the last stanza of yours. So anyways, everybody, thanks for the creative expression in the wall of the chat section. This is what the Elder Scrolls of the chat section will look like for this talk thousands of years from now where people will come and check the chat section. Yeah. <laughs> you know, imagine like 10,000 years in the future and they're like, there was a guy named Mr. Within. He gave a talk. We managed to extract this talk, you know, and we managed to find the chat section and they came inside. <laughs> you know? Anyways, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Uh, by the way, some new updates about the channel. I mean, I guess this, this is you know, simple enough to share. Um, so, guys, pretty much I've given the viewers and anybody who kind of sees this channel, YouTube channel, I see it kind of like a ship. It's like this giant ship I'm building, you know? And it's like I've created three kind of ways where I've decided to create, uh, have all my engagement on social media. And I don't use that m my phone that much, but my phone's with me and it has access to Patreon. So I've created a Patreon community. And also all the books and stuff, they can be found on Amazon, you know. And in, in Patreon, if you join, I just pretty much, I give the books for free. They're just words, you know. But, um... <clears throat> So there's that, and there's also, I want to give the uh, listeners, uh, just go and check the songs on Spotify too, you know. I mean, to be honest, not a lot of talks are there. Like, there's five talks uploaded on Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, check it out, you know. <laughs> uh, there's one last thing. Oh, yeah, and I'm going to soon my format is going to change because I'm going to start this channel where I'm going to be uh, sharing my pretty much a lot of ideas I have on design and geometry. So it's going to be a, a channel where pretty much I'm going to show people how I'm drawing and pretty much teach it, you know. So anyways, guys, those are the updates. Thanks for tuning in. Much blessings and honesty. Rise, mankind. Rise.